Hey guys, how's it going? This is Eric. It's January 2nd, 2019, and I'm back with another video. Um, yesterday's upload got a lot of responses, uh, a lot of people wishing me Happy New Year, um, a lot of questions in the comments, a lot of like video recommendations. So what I'll try and do is answer at least a few of the comments uh, from the previous video. And for this one, we're going to stay in the, uh, the Budapest, Budapest Gambit. And just to clarify, Budapest is d4, knight f6, c4, e5. You cannot play the Budapest if white doesn't play c4 on move 2. If white plays like bishop f4 or knight f3, then you have to choose a, uh, a different opening as black. Uh, so there's one question from Zero. Uh, is the Budapest only effective when white plays d4 and then c4? Uh, the answer to that is, yeah. I mean, you, you can't play the Budapest if white doesn't play uh, d4 and c4. Um, but now I'm actually just being reminded there is a uh, really strange trap, which I guess I'll go ahead and show. Uh, I wasn't planning to show it before this video started, but it will be a nice, uh, another nice kind of simple trap. I don't think it's it's a most likely trap, but let's imagine white plays knight d2. Uh, then I believe e5 is still very playable in the spirit of the Budapest. And after d takes e5, knight g4, uh, let's imagine white plays just kind of a, a bad move here, uh, and bad for a few reasons, the move pawn h3. First reason is it just, okay, obviously allows black to take the, the pawn on e5. Uh, but also, it allows black a different and stronger option. And it's actually black to move and just get a winning position after the next move. If you don't see it, feel free to pause the video and just find the absolutely crushing move for black in this position. The move is a very aesthetic move. Knight e3, trapping the queen. If the pawn takes on e3, then there would be queen h4 with mate after g3, queen takes g3, and the game ends in six moves. Uh, so that's cool, but I don't think too many players play knight d2. I guess we could look it up in the opening explorer if anyone has fallen into this trap. Uh, yeah, let's see how many players have actually played into this. If we switch views here. And let's go forward, opening book. Wow, knight d2. Knight d2 doesn't even make like the, the top, <laughs> what is this, like the top 10 to 15 moves? Um, I assume it has been played. Okay, there's still been a few thousand games here. Uh, e5, knight g4. Oh, wow, seven people played h3. And then everyone found knight e3. Nice, f takes e3. How did white win this one game? Wait, what? <laughs> what is this? View game. How do you not... What? Oh, black just flagged here. <laughs> That's so unfortunate. And he lost 24 rating points. Probably disconnected or something. That's got to be rough, getting to a position with force mate and flagging. Uh, there is some background noise. Hopefully it's not too bad. Um, I guess I'll find out after I finish the recording. But Okay, let's go back and let's stay focused and continue with some more, uh, some more questions. Uh, there is one question from this guy. Hello, Eric at... Four minutes. What's up? <laughs> okay, I got my fresh towel. This is very important. Um, where am I? Here I am. Okay, back to back here. I don't know if people can see this towel just delivered. I'll probably edit this out, or maybe I won't. Who knows? Um, at four zero eight, what happens if white plays knight c three instead? Okay, so the Position that the person's referring to, what is his name? 
Rui Gomes, or Gomez. So this is actually another main variation of the Budapest, arguably one of the most like main lines. After knight g4, uh, let's say bishop f4, knight c6, knight f3, bishop to b4 check. It's this position where, let's say white doesn't go for this line where he's potentially falling for, uh, for this early checkmate trap, but rather plays knight c3. Um, for this, I want to show actually a full game which happened back, I want to say, in, in 1918 between Akiba Rubinstein playing black and Milan Vidmar playing, or sorry, Akiba Rubinstein playing white, Milan Vidmar playing black. Uh, a very beautiful game, and it goes to show what happens when white gets a little bit overly greedy and is a bit too materialistic. And in the following variation, white will manage to hang on to material and, and defend the pawn, but black will get some compensation. So the move to play here is queen e7, attack the pawn. Now the difference between the knight coming to c3 and d2 is the fact that in this position the queen is not obstructed and the queen can, uh, can land on d5, and that's what happened in the game, uh, simply defending the pawn. And if we notice, there are three defenders and three attackers. Uh, one, two, three. So the pawn can't be taken right away. Um, so black goes for some exploitation of some other targets, starting with bishop takes c3, doubling white's pawns, and then going for queen a3. And now we can see, OK, the, the queen side pawns are a bit weak, especially the c3 pawn not having any defenders. And uh, okay, in the game, white played rook to c1. I do want to note that a normal looking move like queen to d2 can be met with a very nice move, queen a5. Keeping an eye on the c3 pawn and also targeting the e5 pawn. And if I'm not mistaken, black is just guaranteed to win a pawn back in this position, as there's no way to uh, keep both of these pawns defended. So yeah, in this game, white played rook to c1. If we notice, a bishop defends the rook from a distance so the rook can't be taken. And um, at first glance, it might seem like black could just take on a2. But I will say this is perhaps a bit overly greedy, and taking on a2 is just bad. Uh, it allows white to play this move pawn h3, and then this knight sadly has to go back to h6 and probably just gets a bad position for black. Uh, so rather than taking on a2, black can play a nice sort of uh, gambiting move, pawn f6, giving up on trying to win the e5 pawn straight up and simply going for the trade to, uh, to keep some initiative. Now in the game, white took on f6 and black recaptures with the knight. Uh, so black is officially just down a pawn in this position, but uh, okay, has some attack against the queen. And there's, there's a few factors which actually give black some nice compensation here. Uh, the first thing is that black is ready to castle very soon. And white is a bit slow to castle. Uh, white's king is going to be stuck in the center for at least the next, uh, next few moves. Um, and then also the queen on a3 is actually... Quite, uh, quite annoying, eyeing many different targets that white has to keep uh, a constant eye on. So in the game, white played queen to d2, black plays d6, ensuring that uh, the bishop is obstructed, can't get away with any bishop takes c7 shenanigans. Uh, white played knight to d4, black castles, pawn e3. And now we get to a key moment where I think starting with black's next move, Every single move for the rest of the game was either a capture or a threat, as black now has really nice forcing combination, uh, starting with the simple knight takes on d4. And now if, if we notice here, it looks like three different things can capture back on d4, um, but we should point out the queen can't capture back because it's tied down to the rook. And the e-pawn doesn't necessarily want to capture back either because it would open up the e-file and leave the bishop a bit less defended. So 
White was provoked to take back with the C pawn. The problem with taking back with the C pawn is it opens up this diagonal and it allows black to keep the initiative in a very nice fashion with the next move, knight e4. Simply hitting the queen, but more importantly, forcing the queen off of this diagonal. And wherever the queen goes, uh, assuming it's a safe square, black can deliver a check and take away white's casting rights. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the queen also has to stay guarding the rook. So white played queen to c2. And then after queen a5 check, white has nothing else but to move the king. King e2 was played. And now the next move was very impressive from black. And it's the type of move I don't know if I would consider playing myself. Maybe I would consider it. But it's a difficult move to play because black is already down a pawn. And the next move sacrifices more material. So if you want to pause your video and at least try and consider some different options, black to move, keep the initiative. And it may seem like a move, perhaps bishop f5, is, uh, is good enough. But Vidmar in this game did not hold back and just sacrificed the rook for the bishop. Rook takes f4, uh, trading off one of white's only developed pieces and uh, also forcing the e-file to open up. And we see in this game that initiative and piece activity was way more important than material, which is the case for a lot of gambit openings. So white took back, and now bishop f5. And the nice thing here, black continues making threats. Uh, the main threat of bishop f5 is just knight g3, attacking the king, the queen, and the rook. Um, and then also, of course, black wants to bring in the rook to e8 and exploit the king along the e-file. And this is already very, very difficult for white to defend. Uh, what happened in the game? White played queen b2, rook e8, and now king f3. A sad move, but, I mean, what else to do? Um, the king is trying to find shelter. Black played knight to d2 check, king to g3. Knight comes back to e4. And now something slightly unusual happened because you would think white is just trying to hold on for dear life. And it would make sense for white to at least repeat the position and move back to f3 and see what black is up to. But white uh, seemingly self-destructed and played the move king h4, uh, which is not the safest place for the king. If we see in this position, white's king is the most active piece not what you want, um, at least in the early middle game. And from this position, it was just a matter of bringing more pieces in and finishing off the attack. Uh, nice move, rook e6, threatening maiden one. Bishop e2 is played. Rook h6 check. Bishop h5. And now, now we can start calculating until forced mate. I'm pretty sure there's forced mate in three moves in this position. Uh, if you want to pause the video, black to move, made in three, shouldn't be too difficult. The move is rook takes h5, and then after king takes h5, um, the fact that the queen is aligned with the king opens up a lot of uh, discover check possibilities, and after bishop g6 check, white just resigned as... Um, Oh, did I lie? I think I lied. Or did I lie? No, I didn't lie. I was imagining f5, black and queen, but f5 is illegal because the bishop is checked. So it was made in three from that position. Uh, the only legal move for white is king g4, and then queen h5 is mate. Um, so this is a really nice, just kind of demonstrative game showing what to do in this knight c3 variation if white does try and perhaps be a bit more greedy and hold on to the pawn. Uh, I think the key move from earlier, if we go back to this moment after rook c1, the key move is, is pawn f6 to accept that you'll be down a pawn and just focus on initiative. Now, I do want to actually go back to the other moment to just show what would happen if white tries to repeat the position after knight d2 king g3, knight e4, um, king f3, 
was, of course, a, a better try. And this is actually a really good attacking exercise um, to try and put yourself in the situation as black, like pretend it's a serious game and ask yourself, what would you do here? Like, how would you continue the attack? I mean, the position looks really good. You have the bishop, the knight, the queen, and the rook, all having potential to work together to mate the king. But what's the best continuation? Um, and I think what I'll do is just show the absolute best continuation. Um, very nice variation, which, uh, which just continues making threats until white is, uh, is essentially paralyzed. So the move to play here is actually to bring in another attacker, in this case a pawn, and to play the nice move pawn h5. Let's imagine white plays a, a move like bishop to d3, then black uh, simply has bishop to g4, and then once the king is forced on the e-file, uh, very bad things will happen. Uh, for example, knight g3, and black is winning a lot of material, if not mating. Um, so for that reason, after h5, white will be inclined to play h3. And now another very nice move from black, pawn h4. And the idea of this move is simply to over-control the g3 square, so that now black is threatening knight t2, which is simply devastating if white allows it. Uh, knight t2 would force white to give away the queen, and black would go on to win the game. So white doesn't have too many ways to escape. Let's imagine pawn to g4, creating some uh, escape square via g2. Then black can continue with knight d2 check. And after king g2, the checks continue, bishop e4 check. The king has to move to one of these squares. And now we see that the knight is bound to come to f3, Let's say king g1, knight f3, king g2, and we actually have a windmill situation. Uh, a windmill in chess is when you have continual discovered checks to, uh, to win material. In this case, black can capture the, the d4 pawn. White is forced to just continue moving the king. King g1, knight f3 check, king g2. And this is a position where white is just completely paralyzed. And um, if you turn on the engine, there's no immediate way to just uh, to win, but the engine will suggest some move like queen c5 and say the valuation is about minus five because white has just so few moves. And uh, I was doing some ding earlier and apparently one of the plans for black is to play bishop c6 and then rook e1 and then eventually uh, win material by taking the rook on h1. Uh, just to demonstrate this, let's imagine a3, bishop c6, rook d1, rook e1, takes, takes, king g1, and now uh, another kind of windmill maneuver, knight f3, king g2, and then knight d2, um, hitting the bishop, and after king g1, knight takes f1, king takes f1, bishop takes h1, and I think we can stop there. Black is up a piece and on the way to win the game. Um, so that was very deep analysis from, uh, from this position, which is already like, seemingly very good for Black. But I think that was a nice demonstration how to uh, just continue to make threats and keep the initiative until you finish things off. So I think I'll end it there. I mean, there's so much more I can talk about regarding the Budapest, and I know there's a lot of questions uh, yet to be answered, but, uh, but keep them coming. I'm hoping to do more videos in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Um, if you have questions, if you have video suggestions, uh, leave a comment below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.